Welcome back to Jews on Film. My name is Harry. I am a former film major, current Jew, and uh, somewhat qualified, I'd say, to talk about some of these Jewish films. This week, we'll be discussing City Slickers. And uh, as always, I'm joined by Daniel. My name is Daniel Zana. I'm a uh, video editor, filmmaker, currently still a Jew, as Harry mentioned, also a film buff and uh, amateur podcaster. Uh, We're joined today. uh, Very, very excited to be having our guest and former East Village neighbor Jason Diamond here. He's an author of a book called The Sprawl and a book called Searching for John Hughes. He also writes for publications like The Paris Review, New York Times, GQ, Esquire, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and Tablet Magazine. It's Jason Diamond, everyone. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about City Slickers. I know this is a audio medium, but for the listeners at home, I am wearing a Western themed shirt in honor of our film. Uh, I did not have a Mets cap. So I want to start off with a few softball questions to kind of get you warmed up. Growing up, as you did, what was your experience like with Jewish films? What did that mean to you? Every time I get, I, I do get asked this question a lot in different ways, or at least maybe I have the same answer for different questions, but Woody Allen kind of lived, hovered over my, my family in a very weird, like both sides of my, my, my parents got divorced when I was very young and my father is an immigrant, you know, survivor family. My mom's family is, she's like the third or fourth generation American and they're Chicago. My dad's New York and Woody Allen was like one of those great, weird, I feel bad even saying this now because he's just like, you can't even say his name in public sometimes, but right. you know, there were all these like jokes that I would find out later, like reference to Woody Allen movie and in, in just the way they talked about Woody Allen films in my family. It was like when there was a new Woody Allen movie there, that was kind of a big deal. And then for me personally, it was Dirty Dancing. Like when Dirty Dancing came out, it took me a while. Like the, upon first viewing it, I didn't realize it was so Jewish. The whole Catskills thing, like my family didn't go to the Catskills. So I didn't know all of that, but I, it was so familiar to me to watch that movie the first time when I was like five or six. And yeah, so that was really kind of like the, I think the starting point and why I've probably always been obsessed with like Borscht Belt stuff. And I have not seen Dirty Dancing, so... Uh, we're going to have to add that to the list. I never yeah, thought yeah, of that as, sure. as a Jewish movie like that. We might have to have you back on the podcast to discuss yeah. it. I will talk all day about Dirty Dancing. It is when you say like, what's your experience with Jewish? Like I grew up with musicals. Like I love it. I love a nice tune. But yeah, it's like, you know, like a lot of like Neil Simon stuff. And I don't know, that always kind of was like something I always thought was really funny because, uh, I didn't know like where like certain things began and where certain where certain things ended. Like I don't know the difference between Cole Porter and Gershwin. Like they're both like one. They could both be Jewish to me. Like <laughs> it's kind of just this sort of funny thing. And to go back to your thing about the Catskills, just to provide context for those who maybe didn't grow up on the East Coast or or you know are not super familiar. Do you want to give us like a quick summary of like what that experience is? Yeah, I think it's been kind of popularized now thanks to. Um, Maisel, sure. The Maisel show, which I'm not a huge fan of. I've read enough about the history, so I should remember the dates, but I'm terrible with numbers uh, past past the afternoon. So forgive me for not telling you the exact dates. But you know, there used to be a lot of no Jews allowed hotels, just like there were no you know black people allowed hotels, and in some places no Catholics allowed. And I think Jews, just being the way we are, were like, well, we're just going to start our own thing and. I think one, it was one place in particular in in the Catskill Mountains, like they opened like a small, I want to say like, maybe it was dairy, maybe it was like summer hotel or something like that. And it just kind of turned into this whole thing. And, you know, that's just like what Jews in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century seemed to do a lot. We were like, well, we'll just make our own thing. And um, it turned into just a place for New York Jews to get away into this sort of like hothouse for comedy, for music, for all kinds of entertainment, you know, basically shaped modern comedy. Totally. Yeah. I'm reading the um, Mel Brooks autobiography right now. And, uh, you know, he got his start, you know, kind of doing some acts up there. A lot of, a lot of comedians started up there, like you mentioned. Um, So sort of on that, I want to kind of segue into talking about like nostalgia um, 
for me, this movie came out in the 90s. And so like it's nostalgic for me. Harry's our youth correspondent, so he's a bit younger. So but I remember seeing this movie and I wanted to talk to you because I'm a follower of your Instagram. I do enjoy it, um, but it's very nostalgic. And I wondered if you could talk about sort of what's with the nostalgic kick that that people have. I mean, I find myself guilty of it, too. I went to Las Vegas recently and I couldn't help when going to the Neon Museum, just get like start. I just loved all the old signs and looking at old pictures and things like that. But what is it about nostalgia, especially Jewish nostalgia that you kind of like post a lot about? Why is there such an appetite for it? You think? Well, I think nostalgia is it. It's a weird thing. It's like such a, such a two way street because like on one hand you can enjoy it and you can kind of get a lot out of like looking at the way things were and realizing that the classics or at least whatever you consider the classics kind of never go out of style. Um, but on the other hand, I think if you get too mired in nostalgia, you start to formulate this idea of like a time that you think things were like this once, sure. but maybe they weren't. And that's when you start kind of realizing, you know, well, people will be like, Oh, the 1950s, it's such a great time. And I'm like, I don't think most black people would say that. Sure. And I don't think most, you know, or, you know, like it was so beautiful in the Gilded Age. It's like, yeah, I don't think uh, black people or women or any immigrants would say that, you know, so you always have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. And I think, with Jews, I mean, I've thought about this so much. And I mean, the Jewish experience, which, you know, I think if you're from an Ashkenazi background, especially, you know, the Jewish experience is this funny thing that we've kind of been raised on this sort of sweet sort of idea of like the old country, Bubby, like your your great 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 bubby making chicken stock and blah 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 blah, and then everything gets bad for a little while except maybe there's a fiddler on the roof and it's kind of like tevia is playing you through this massacre and then it turns into the you know it's just all these different like ways of looking at it but at the end of the day i just think we're a culture of people who have survived and learned how to thrive and there's just something so kind of beautiful about that and um I think we're at a point right now where I, as a, as a culture and like everybody, not just Jews, but we're all kind of just trying to survive and trying to enjoy right. life a little bit. And I don't know, you know, like you always, you think back to like, like Hebrew school, or you think back to bar mitzvahs, or you think back to anniversaries you might've gone to or anything like that. And, you know, the whole Lachayim thing is very, I think about it a lot. I'm like saying Lachayim is very beautiful these days because yeah, uh, I'm always trying to like think more about like how to enjoy it and how to. It's I just I don't know. I think Jews are just a nostalgic people. Where right. I just really you know we always have been. I think I think it's inherent to any sort of culture, or religion. You know, something where there's a lot of looking back. There's a lot of transmission and you know foundation that's sort of carried through generations. So you're you're almost always looking back to a certain extent. And then you know I, I totally agree with where you were getting at, just sort of the comforts of of youth. You know, the familiarity of traditions with chicken soup that's sort of passed down. There's there's something to that that I think you know is, is definitely going to be at play with Jews couple of weeks we're gonna like the week or two is Purim and we're gonna like look back at like some guy who did try to destroy us and gonna make a just, there's always just something you know we're looking back on and I, I think that's nice but again I wouldn't want to go back to the to those times because they were just killing Jews left and right probably and making us build pyramids and stuff like that yeah but it's, it's true you, you can't survive persecution without the whole persecution part so right i don't really want to go back to that there's always somebody who's being held down so i try not to like look at anything through like rose-colored lenses i am a believer that the, the classics never go out of style i hate when people i don't hate things a lot but when somebody's like oh i don't like bob dylan or i don't like miles davis or you know the beatles are overdone and i'm like what are you talking about? It's like, what are you saying about like Beethoven or right. things are good and they're always going to be good. And that's just how it works. And yep, totally. Just Absolutely. always looking for the good stuff. If you're not already, I would recommend everyone follow Jason on social media. Cause he's got some great photos of, uh, you know, of times past. And I agree with you. I feel like they expo not to bring up Woody again, Woody Allen again, but I feel like he, he talked about that theme a lot in midnight in Paris yeah. or, you know, they're time traveling through every, generation every age and every age that he goes to 
I think it's Owen Wilson is, you know, coming across Gertrude Stein or other people and there was, oh, it was the 20s. Oh, it was the 40s. Oh, those are the best generations. So it sounds like you have passed the test and you are ready to move on to the next round to review City Slickers. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. And we're back. We are here today with Jason Diamond to talk about City Slickers. Harry, before we get started, can you read to us the IMDb summary of City Slickers? I will absolutely do that. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, speaking of nostalgia, as we were going through, this is definitely a movie I would say is mired in nostalgia for for your youth, you know, for an (laughs) earlier pre midlife crisis, so to speak. And uh, with that, I will read the uh, IMDb summary that was posted here. So. It reads, Mitch is a middle-aged big city radio ad salesman. He and his friends, Ed and Phil, are having midlife crises. They decide the best birthday gift is to go on a two-week holiday in the Wild West, driving cattle from New Mexico to Colorado. There, they they will meet cowboy Curly, who not only teaches them how to become real cowboys, but also one or two other things about life in the open air of the West. Thank you so much for that. Before we talk about this. Yes. Harry is the, Harry, can I ask, like, generally how old you are, like, decade you were born in absolutely like, we, i we, was born uh we may bleep was, this here if you don't want it to get yeah, out you can bleep no, it. Uh, <laughs> i'm yeah. not kidding i just <laughs> want to know if i'm like taught like i was born many years after this movie came out or, or not right. many but a couple of years right. i uh when i say i was a recent you know college film major graduate i mentioned that because it was only a couple months ago i graduated from college You're so Clinton, baby 98 is that like yeah we'll take it we'll take it yeah okay. we'll, take it. We'll, we'll put it in there okay <laughs> uh, yeah i'm, I'm 83 so yeah i'm yeah, i was eight when this movie came out yeah i'm i'm 80 but like the reason i ask is because i do think like and i mean i don't want to get too into it right away but i do think there is something kind of interesting about this movie and like when it came out and like things i was noticing at the time as a as a 10 year old so anyways oh sure yeah i, I mean wait to hear it, yeah. watching this i remember seeing it and then i think i saw also curly's gold but Second i one. you know i think oh yeah that's the sequel yeah so the movie was directed by ron underwood and written by lowell gans and babalu mandel just doing a cursory search i would guess that babalu mandel and lowell gans are probably members of the tribe and uh, Ron Underwood has done movies. He kind of had a, a big string of hits in the 90s. He directed uh, Tremors, City Slickers, Mighty Joe Young. He's gone on to do a lot of TV work as well. You know, he did Pluto Nash, Speechless, a bunch of other things. So, yeah, it's a, a very Jewish crew, cast and crew. But I, I kind of wanted to kind of walk through the film and, and sort of talk talk things out. So as a... Harry mentioned we have our three main characters. We have Phil Burquist, played by Daniel Stern. We have Mitch Robbins, played by Billy Crystal. And we have Ed Farillo, played by Bruno Kirby. Jason, you want to kick it off? Any opening thoughts? I mean, there's a lot. First of all, I think Bob Lou Mandel is a genius. I think he's sort of like, he's somebody that I'm a big fan of, and I don't think it's enough credit for being a great writer, kind of in that like Nora Ephron sort of realm <laughs> of people who kind of get the cheesiness of romance and kind of makes it into something kind of sweet and nice to watch on film. So I just wanted to put that out there. Sure. I'm a fan of like, I don't want to say cheesiness, but I do like a little cheese. Like he's a good cheese. Like he's good at it. But I think the first thing that kind of pops out to me about this movie, and this is so weird, but when I was watching it again the other day, and I have to say I turned 40 a year and a half ago. And I, this was the first movie I watched when I turned 40 well, because okay. it, it really had so like why I asked earlier about your age is because I think when I was a kid, the boomers, like the baby boomers, I think really fixated on middle age. Mm-hmm. Um, and they made they made 40 out to be this big deal. And I think like Billy Crystal's even younger in this movie. I think he's, he's like 39. 30. I'm turning 39. So I'm I'm I pictured myself in that in that role, you know? Yeah, he's like doing the ear hair thing at the start. <laughs> right, but, right. But like parents, like, I mean, it was like a fear, I think, my parents' generation had of middle age, which is kind of insane to me because I really thought about this movie leading up to turning 40 a lot. And then mm-hmm. I watched it and I'm like, I don't feel at all like that. I don't need to go run with the bulls or do any of that stuff. But um, right, right. That was a big thing for me, that thinking about that. And then the other thing was, I, I think it's funny that I'm always obsessed with this very 90s thing 
about um, Jews who it's kind of like in on the show or in the movie, it's kind of vaguely Jewish. Yes. I was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like Mitch Robbins is one of those names that you're like, that could very well be a Jewish name. Like your, your family could have been Rabinowitz. Sure. Like, and then they just changed it to Robbins. Sure. But like, you know, like Daniel Stern, who is in like the most, like, who's great. I love Daniel Stern. Um, like Phil Berquist, like what is right. that? That's, you know, it's well, like George Costanza or Elaine Bennis or sure. any of that stuff to me. I deliberately put in their names at the top because I wanted to call out how none of them are explicitly Jewish, but they all, I mean, I would say for sure, Phil and Mitch, they feel the most Jewish. Ed mm-hmm. is very much not Jewish. He's othered in terms of his ethics and his sort of macho-ness and things like that. And we'll kind of get into that. I do want to talk about masculinity in this movie because it's like a huge thing. We have, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a toxic man? Which was not a word in the 90s, 91. I don't think that was a phrase that was bandied about as much, but, you know, right up top, it's like 530 in the morning or 515 in the morning. And Mitch's mom calls him up on the phone and wishes him a happy birthday. And like, if that's not the most Jewish thing where he's mouthing the uh, the story that his mom says to him and his his wife is good morning, you know, you know, throughout the movie, I felt so many lines were just like really poignant. And I felt that, you know, a lot of that was like the writing and the delivery, but they just kind of like go by and, uh, you know, they're not major plot points, but they're like wisdom that either Curly's saying or Mitch is saying to his wife or to, or to others, you know, did you ever get to that point in your life where da, 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 and like just the way that the way that this stuff is delivered at the beginning of the film, before they get on, on this uh, trip, you know, really made me think a lot. Yeah. I, I want to jump in. I, I do think that this film, you know, talking about thinking about its Jewishness, it's not, you know, explicitly Jewish in a way that some of the other films we've discussed are, and it's not, you know, knowing about these characters in the context of the film aren't necessarily Jewish, but like, I think some of the things you're pointing out, this film is so Jewish tinged, I think in character names and little touches, you know, that's that whole episode in the beginning you were just describing where, you know, his mother is calling him on his birthday, you know, shout out to my grandmother if she's listening, but she does that every single year on my dad's birthday, recounts the exact story. And we all know it at this point. And it's a heartfelt little moment that, you know, I, I was writing notes during the film and I immediately wrote, that's a Jewish mother. And these are clearly, if you're watching with the lens that I definitely was in the context of this film, this movie has a Jewish sensibility to it. If it never really does become explicit throughout the rest of the film, and obviously we'll get to the rest of the film, but it, it doesn't overtly ever become a Jewish movie, I think, in an explicit sense, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, we had some other characters in the film. So in addition to our three main characters who go on this sort of cattle herding trip for two weeks in uh, the West, there's also uh, Ira and Barry Shalowitz, who are played by David Paymer and Josh Mostel. And they are, I feel like, maybe like the token Jews in the film, oh, yeah. uh, in addition to, to Billy Crystal. But like the supporting cast, I feel like they are the Nebishi Jews, whereas like Billy Crystal comes into his own as a man. I feel like they are like the comic relief, butt of the joke kind of Jews. You know, they're stand-ins for Ben and Jerry's, they're Barry and Ira. And so they've yep. made millions and now they're going and enjoying their success and constantly videotaping everything. In addition, we have Ben Jessup and Steve Jessup, a, a father and son duo who are dentists and i thought there was a funny line where he said where are you from baltimore we have a dental practice there really you're both dentists yes we're black and we're dentists let's not make an issue and then also there's bonnie rayburn who is the lone female on the trip just to get a sense of of who's coming on this trip and and the idea is that they are moving a bunch of cattle from one area to another area and that's sort of that is the bulk of our trip and we also can't forget that at the start of the movie, at the there's a, a birthday party for Billy Crystal, and we're introduced to his son, who is played by Jake Gyllenhaal. Spotted that. Yeah. Big fan of Russ and Daughters. Jewish, you know, Jewish guy. Nice. His sister was my neighbor for a while. Oh, nice. Yeah, they're cool. they're very. The Gyllenhaals are they're good. They're good Jews. And lastly, rounding out our cast is the great Jack Palance, who plays Curly, the sort of tough as nails lead cowboy, kind of helping out our participants in this trip. And then also um, espousing a lot of cowboy wisdom uh, to all who will listen. 
Although uh, it's really only, I feel like Billy Crystal who kind of breaks through to him. Everyone else kind of like fears him. Yeah. I mean, I think the Jack Palance character is really fascinating. I mean, you know, you talk about things that are Jewish and inherently Jewish. I think um, a big part of this movie is that I, I, I personally find endearing. And also as the son of a Yankees fan, um, they bring up the Yankees a lot. I think American mythologies kind of play into this film a lot, like the cowboy and the, you know, Mickey Mantle and the baseball players. Sure, and, sure. You know, and I, I think about that a lot as, um, you know, I, I, I think about my own father who's an immigrant and, you know, to him, Mickey Mantle was like, you know, everything and cowboys and Indians were everything. Like this is how he learned about America. And I, I don't know if I, obviously like we've, we've already talked about how like Mitch Robbins isn't the most Jewish sounding name, but it kind of is. I don't think he's an immigrant really either. I think he's probably an American born guy and the way his mother talks on the, on the phone obviously kind of gives that away. But I do think a lot about like that, that, that generation, like the baby boomers, you know, were kind of the first generation of, of Jews to sort of have any sort of, I don't know, it felt maybe a little safer for them and a little bit more like they could be part of a country. And so they had to kind of catch up and get really obsessed with like the myths and the, and the culture of, of America. And that's why I think it's really kind of sweet and cool that he's just so obsessed with baseball and so obsessed with Indians and Cowboys and stuff like that. That That's why the curly thing is really cool to me. Yeah. I, I think this all goes back to our original conversation we had about finding a sort of timelessness in tradition and in nostalgia for a movie with characters that are so concerned with, you know, where they are in their lives and at the sort of midlife crisis, it's almost like they're clinging to their mythologies. They're clinging to these timelessness, you know, of this, the myth you were explaining of like the old West or the myth of baseball. And there's an entire scene in this film devoted to explaining to the female character, you know, what the power of baseball is and why they all love it in their tradition. And I, I do think that a big threat of this film is, so how do you find, you know, what's meaningful to you, what's timelessness within that? And we haven't gotten to it yet, but there's that sort of big moment from Curly who delivers that speech of you have to find in life what's important to you. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing, just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean shit. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you gotta figure out. Before we actually get to the um, cattle ranch, Jason, you were mentioning it earlier. Mitch does have a party. He has like a uh, a big celebration and he invites his friends. And it's at that point that Ed, who is we set up in the they set up in the film. You know, this film starts out and they're doing the, the bull run in Pamplona, Spain. But it sounds like Ed has always egged on Mitch and Phil and, and gotten them involved in these sort of like harebrained daredevil type sports and, and sort of we find out later a little bit more why, you know, what in his life sort of led him to sort of seize the day and kind of do something that was outside of the norm. But so Ed is presenting this trip for them and Mitch's wife is basically like, I'm going to my parents. We need a break. Go play with the cattle. And it's at that point that uh, Phil's wife, who you know, Phil is sort of, we set up, is sort of this very whipped guy. Uh, his wife is portrayed as this sort of nag and is not too kind to him. And, you know, it comes out at the party that he, he works at a, his in-law's grocery store. And one of the cashiers, uh, played by Yardley Smith, who's famously Lisa Simpson, she's pregnant, or at least she says she's pregnant at the party. And there's a whole big explosion. And it's at that point that he tells his wife off. And they uh, sort of agree to go on this trip. Any thoughts on that party? Was there anything sort of especially 90s to you that stuck out besides the hair and the clothes? <laughs> I mean, I want to know how she found the party. Like, oh, how did she find out that's where he was and how did she get up there? And I, that, that, that's always kind of like the suspension of disbelief kind of thing sure. that the 90s was so great for with movies because you just kind of took it at face value. Like today, you'd be like, oh, she probably texted him and this and that. There's no air tags, no phones, none of that kind of stuff. So yeah, you're right. And, and half the drama from the scene is over fighting over the one phone and sort of cutting the cord of the phone and oh. then trying to find the other one in the bedroom. You know, that, that's the kind of thing that if everyone had a cell phone in their pocket, the drama would not necessarily be there in the right. same way. And also, and also I've got to say, I, I love, you mentioned Bruno, Ed, Bruno Kirby, and I love him in this movie because the thing, I, I, first of all, I love Bruno Kirby. He's just an absolute gem of an actor. I miss him. I wish he wasn't dead. I love the fact that I, I have this theory that I'm like, I'm okay with Italians playing Jews. Like it's like the one 
usually like with an Italian plays a Jew, I'm like, okay, that's fine. It's, I see where it works. I love how they didn't make him Jewish because first, because Bruno Kirby is like the one actor, the one Italian actor that I'm like, no, you couldn't play Jewish. There's something so Italian about him that it like it, he just has to be who he is. And he plays such a good foil to them in a lot of ways. I I love, I love his character in this movie. You know, we set up sort of, I would say Mitch is kind of in the middle, right? On one hand, you have like a wimpy guy who's like Phil. And on the on the other hand, you have this macho guy who's Ed. And, you know, the their character arcs kind of play out differently in the film. And as we progress, we kind of hear a little bit more about their backgrounds and what led them to be the way that they are. There is quite a bit to, to, to get into in terms of like how that comes out. But yeah, I do feel like at, at, just to go back to the story, I feel like after they've gone on their trip, there's really fun 90s stuff that i really enjoyed gotta love a good montage so you know they're putting on their cowboy clothes and they're trying on hats and then they cut to the other person and they're like no nope. and then they put on the other one and they try no nope. yeah and then finally mitch settles on his mets cap harry as a yankees fan are you okay with that or i'm fine with it i'm not okay with how the movie tries to paint him as this yankees fan with mantle or whatever and then puts him in a mets hat the whole time very weird and- and in real life, Billy Crystal is a very, you know, pronounced Yankees fan. Die so why don't they just, yeah. So why don't they just give him a Yankees hat? That was a, that was a strange casting decision or costuming decision in my opinion. Right. Otherwise I'm okay with it. Yeah, he's a Yankees guy, big Yankees fan. Didn't he do the movie? He did the movie on Maris and Mantle a few years ago. Okay. That's about right. Like, that's always like, that's a kind of a funny thing. Like, I think like, again, like the nineties Jewish guy thing, I think Seinfeld does that a lot too, where they're kind of vague on, what team he likes. I think he's actually a Mets fan in real life because he's from Queens, but okay. I, I don't know. I feel like there's this like kind of weird confusion. Maybe it's a, it's a, I don't know. Maybe that's just something cause I didn't grow up full time in New York that I don't understand that you can kind of switch back and forth, but I do have a Mets hat and a Yankees hat in my closet. So I, I can't really talk. At at the risk of angering some Mets fans, I do think that part of the sort of Jewish, you know, persona is this nebbishness a little bit. And I think a big theme in this movie, if we're going to talk about some of the Jewish elements of it, is these characters shedding their, you know, what what do they call? Curly calls them city folk. Yeah, Yeah, slickers. Yeah, shedding their right. I guess so. Right, and it's (laughs) shedding their sort of like nebbish Jewishness and their, you know, their sort of indoor persona and becoming, you know, these outdoorsmen. These you know, big, strong people. And I think changing the hats is a very big moment for Billy Crystal's character because he sheds his Mets hat and becomes, you know, a proper cowboy. And I I do think that there's something different thematically about shedding the Mets hat than there is the Yankee hat. I think there's a little bit more of a, uh, okay, no more Mets, you know, embracing a strong, when, when you're on a, when you're rooting for a team like the Yankees, a little bit more of a winning team doesn't have the same effect. And uh, I apologize to those viewers that I might have offended with that. The standard for assimilation. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a good read. <laughs> like that. In the podcast, we talk about stretches a lot. And like, we're, we always try to do like the square peg in the round hole as far as like biblical associations. And so like stretches are in- encouraged in the podcast. So go for it. I would say not to worry. You know, it's interesting about the costumes because at the end of the film, after everything has happened, they are back in their sort of, you know, Ed is in his sporting goods jacket. Billy Crystal is kind of back to his Yankee stuff. And, and so maybe they're just like back into their city costumes and back to normal. Uh, so they don't completely go full on. Although, spoiler alert, he does bring home a cow with him. So, you know. <laughs> it certainly feels like they're forever changed by the experience. Oh, absolutely. If they don't embrace it fully. Yeah. And, and so... As we are introduced to everyone else who's kind of going on this trip, um, and like I said, we're introduced to Curly, there's a very this very strong distinction between like city folk and country folk in terms of how they approach everything and how they um, interact with people of the same sex, of the fairer sex. And in terms of, I want to talk about that for a second, if we can pause, because I do feel like this is a very 90s film and that it's very unwoke in terms of if I could say that word, I don't know if unwoke, but just like 90s, you know, it's very 90s in terms of how women are portrayed in the film. They're either being talked about nagging, they're either talking about how they are impregnated or stare, their asses are stared at and things like that. And they don't really have like such a meaty role in the film. This is very much like a guy's film. And uh, yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. 
I think if I'll just jump in quickly, that a lot of the characters, also the men themselves, a lot of their moments of growth and overcoming is is framed around these big questions of regarding women. You know, there's this whole scene where Billy Crystal's character is bonding with Curly over this question that had been asked him prior about if an alien spaceship came out with a beautiful woman and no one knew about it, would you cheat on your wife? And the second it's over, she's going to get back into her spaceship and fly away for eternity. Would you do it? She a redhead? Could be. I like redheads. You ever been married? No. You ever been in love? Once. A lot of their growth and a lot of their conversations are framed around or, and at the expense of the other women in the film. I, I made the comment to you, Daniel, that it's almost like this movie fails the reverse Bechdel test, which is, you know, a famous test that's, you know, put on movies to see if there are any two female characters in a movie that have a conversation in a scene with, and don't bring up any men. And this movie definitely doesn't pass that test, but it also don't, I don't think passes the reverse where there's not I don't think there's a single scene in the movie where any of the men don't bring up women and don't objectify or just talk about in a certain lens. And I, I think it's it's used as a catalyst for their growth. So there is something about, you know, their characters kind of learning to be monogamous or learning to, you know, have reinvigorate their relationships with their spouses. But it's still not the sort of best light to cast any of these women, these characters. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's also just very I mean, like it kind of this kind of goes back to the tro the middle age trope that I was talking about earlier, like that was a big thing. It's like a John Updike novel or something like uh, all these like mid-century novels about middle-aged men. Like they're all having affairs. You know, it's like you watch Mad Men. If you, you know, obviously it's a different time, but yeah. that kind of idea that like all these men who are like approaching middle age or middle age are so unhappy that all they could do is think about having sex with other women and they're unhappy with their, their marriage. And, um, that's something you see a lot in movies from this year, I feel like. Right. Uh, and it's, I don't know if it's, they tackle it better than others or worse. I can't really tell. It's very hard to say, but I feel like it's like, I think Billy Crystal's got a lot of issues that I don't really know if it, I don't know. That's, that's the unbelievable thing. It's like, it's the magic bullet solution. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden he just sort of finds himself and as a new lease on life. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. a very like, I don't know if like, Gen X or millennials or whatever is, comes after that. I don't know if like any of the, the generations that come after that can ever kind of believe that sort of thing is possible. Like I, I love the idea of that, but I don't believe it's, you know, the, and the movie itself, I think is aware of that because there's this moment when Billy Crystal's character is going on, you know, back, he's going to abandon all of the cattle and he's going to go back to, back to their home base and then the, his other two friends are say they're going to stick with the cattle and he says to them he says just because you're staying with these cattle and you're going to finish this cattle run that's not going to change all the problems you have at home that's not going to make a big difference and then 10 minutes later it's like the movie forgets about that and his character comes back and they save them and all is well again but it seemed it was self-aware but maybe not enough to actually produce a better reason for why this is going to change their entire lives I wanted to get back to what you were saying, Jason, about like the way that women are portrayed. I do feel like, like you said also, Harry, it's used as a device to kind of like separate the good from the evil. So I want to, again, stretch alert. I feel like Ed is in, in certain moments is like the Yates O'Hara, the evil inclination. So they're riding together and we see Bonnie riding on the horse and her butt is up, you know, bouncing up and down on the um, on the saddle. And then Ed looks at her and he starts a conversation with Mitch about, oh, yeah, you definitely, you know, you, you would cheat on your wife with her, wouldn't you? And, and you know, I think he's wearing red, it's, you know, evil, whatever, a stretch alert. But I feel like they, they kind of tease out this idea that then he brings up with uh, Curly about in infidelity and things like that and, and really just kind of needling him. It's at that point where as they're riding through, I believe the device that gets Curly um, alone with Mitch, you know, they have to, I believe Mitch takes out his automatic coffee grinder. So right. we're really cementing this idea that they're city slickers. So our Ben and Jerry stand-ins are taking a shower with a canteen and they're videotaping it. They're hanging out while they're doing camp. And then because they have a big fight, the three of them. So they're making up and they're bonding over like gourmet French roast coffee, I believe is what he says. Um, so he grinds the coffee. He causes a huge stampede with the cows. And as a punishment, Curly who's frightening at this point. He smokes a lot. He just has this big knife. He's like a pretty 
quiet character. We don't hear from him until Mitch and uh, Curly kind of have their special alone time where Curly dispatches a lot of uh, cowboy wisdom. And one of the things he talks about, as you guys had alluded before, talking about cowboys being a dying breed and and it's all about finding that one thing. And Mitch says, what is that one thing? And he said, that's for you to find out. So, you know, it's almost like going to a rabbi and hearing just a little like a, some, a little something that's like, well, we'll click for you. The wise person is like, it's kind of such an enjoyable thing for me in, in some movies. Like I really like the guy or the person or the, whoever it is that has all the wisdom. And this one person who's Billy Crystal gets, gets to hear the wisdom. And right. it's, it's really funny. It's like really, it's like magical. It's like, you know, this, it's kind of like a fairy tale in a sort of way, which kind of makes the, um, the, the stuff that's hard to believe sort of more believable, I guess. Sure. I mean, it's like or, ne- yeah. Neo and the Oracle and the Matrix or yeah. Moses going up to Mount Sinai. Yeah, I, I want to jump on this thread. And only because you guys are describing Curly as being this rabbinical figure. You know, I this this felt like a stretch and I'm not sure if it's what the movie was going for, because I think the movie's uh, the movie's conclusion is that the one is sort of find that one thing that's important, which might be your family, your lease on life. But there's there's an allusion to that kind of being, you know, God, he's like sort of it's a single finger raised. It's pointing to the sky. I, I absolutely think it's in this question of finding reason, finding purpose in your life, you know, one thing to cling to. It's a little bit of a stretch, and I'm not sure if that's the what they intended most audiences to get from that. But through this lens, I, I absolutely could see that as being, you know, pointing up to, to God in, in heaven kind of thing, just like a, a one finger up. That's the meaning of life. Yeah, I could see that for sure. You know, so after... Mitch and Curly have this sort of like heart to heart conversation and they Mitch has like transmitted all this cowboy knowledge into his brain. They regroup in camp. They have a nice sleepover. And I think at a certain point, Mitch sort of stands up to Curly and he says, just kill me or leave me the hell alone because I want to he's playing the harmonica and they're kind of singing songs together. But he breaks through to Curly because he's like, you know, shit or get off the pot, like do something or don't do something, but kind of leave me alone. And I think Curly kind of gets respect for Mitch, who's not just a city slicker. He's willing to like stand up and be a a macho man kind of in in the vein of Ed, but not quite, you know, sort of in the middle there. And I, I think for Curly, the the switch flips a little bit and he starts to respect Mitch more. And I think we end that scene with Mitch playing harmonica and Curly singing along. And so they're kind of like finally bonding. And it's just very sweet and sentimental for somebody who up until that point was displayed as this sort of like tough as nails cowboy. There's a great line there at the end when he's playing on the harmonica, this Western song, presumably Curly sings it. And then there's this sort of throwaway gag at the very end of the scene where he says, where, uh, where Billy Crystal's character says, you know, any show tunes? Which, <laughs> just to call back to our original conversation about, you know, our lo- Jewish love for Broadway. Yeah. yeah, it's ingrained in us. Yeah, absolutely. But sadly, uh, Curly is not long in this world. Uh, he passes away in the next scene. I believe they are making camp back with the rest of the gang. And they find out that Curly is sitting up smoking a cigarette and has just passed away standing up. Um, So they decide to bury him instead of burying him with all of his belongings. They take his vest and his cowboy hat and kind of mosey along throughout the movie. There are other cowboy characters. There is the cook. uh, His name is cookie. And uh, there are two sort of heel cowboys who are sort of bullies. It is our our main three characters job to sort of protect Bonnie uh, from from the bullying of those uh, two characters. And throughout the film, there are several scenes where they're getting in fights with them and they're getting drunk and things like that. And that's sort of another opportunity for our characters to prove their manliness and macho-ness. I feel like there are a lot of missed opportunities for Jewish summer camp jokes in this movie, which I think is definitely a, a thing, something uh, they kind of missed out on. They wanted to make it any Jewier. Like they could have made, you know, because I feel like they're also protecting Barry and Ira. I kind of always feel like there's always like a bully at some camp and like somebody has to be the protector. And it's always like the kid who doesn't want to be, but, you know, like the Billy Crystal kind of guy who has to just be the good person and save, <laughs> save the dirtier ones. I, I think that point is in line with this whole movie where it, it feels so... Jewish, you know, Jewish in that sense, you know, with the hyphen between the W and the I, Jewish in the sense that 
there's clearly, it was clearly written by a Jewish team and it's clearly produced. And there, there's a lot of, I, I didn't mention this yet, but they throw the word schmuck around a bunch, you know, oh, yeah. and there's this clear Jewish sensibility to the movie, but the movie never explicitly, and the characters themselves are never explicitly Jewish. Curly's, you know, we mentioned he dies in his, they kind of erect a cross on the ground for him. And there's, throughout the rest of the movie, the, the family doesn't have a Jewishness. So I think going the route of, really pulling them from a Jewish summer camp. Cause you get the sense that these friends you know, met each other in their Jewish summer camp and developed this kind yeah. of relationship there. But if they had gone fully that route, they would have had to create a more Jewish movie. And instead, I think there's just these Jewish little pieces that we can pick up on what's otherwise, if it's a religious, you know, not necessarily a Jewish religious movie and more likely just a sort of secular story about midlife crises. There's this quote by Lenny Bruce that I love to always mention in, if your last name is Smith and you live in New York, you're Jewish. If your last name is, I, I, this is, I'm totally misquoting it, but this is the just, if your name is Schwartz and you live in Iowa, you're Gentile. It's basically like, I, I just think a lot of people just were under that assumption during the eighties and nineties. It's like, listen, New York Jewish, right? We don't have to like spell it out for you. I, I, I that's what I've kind of just at this point decided. Like, it's like, if you know, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> It's what this movie feels like. Yeah. For sure. I mean, you have to remember at the time in 91, Billy Crystal was sort of like peak Billy Crystal. Yeah. And this was not a, by any means, the Jewish movie to appeal to the Jewish crowd. This was a mainstream movie starring a mainstream star and was sort of aimed at, you know, a cowboy movie is a fairly, it can appeal to a broad audience. So kind of shoehorning these Jews into a sort of, it's similar to like Blazing Saddles or Frisco Kid, where you're shoehorning characters and it's like a fish out of water store in some regards. Um, you know, speaking of water, our cows are on our, sorry for the bad segue, but, uh, you know, our, our, our flock of cows after Curly has passed away and then two more horses pass away because Cookie has gotten too drunk and they fall off of the side of a cliff. But Cookie is fine. He needs to be driven to a, or he needs to be taken to a hospital. So our characters are now splitting up and the rest of the herd is being led by our three characters through the mountains. They have no GPS, no cell phones, and they're just kind of going in a very vague direction and looking for the ranch. Uh, but the film's kind of wraps up with the, our three characters leading the herd of cattle through a treacherous rainstorm. And it's at this point where they sort of assume their final forms as mensch cowboys, you know, Billy Crystal trades up his uh, Mets hat for Curly's old cowboy hat. And they, you know, they're putting on their, their rain slickers and they are finally becoming the, the men that they set out to be in terms of uh, their cowboyness. They did it. I think that this movie has a very, you know, there's a sense of becoming a real man. There's this masculine accomplishing sense. So this big set piece is about putting their lives on the line, crossing these, uh, you know, crossing this river. Although what's interesting, and I'm only thinking of this now as I'm saying this, is that there's actually a little bit of a, a more feminine sort of nurturing element of Billy of Mitch's character where the final moment after they've, you know, been these strong cowboys getting these people across is him diving back into the river, grabbing the little baby calf and kind of Norman called Norman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Norman, by uh, by his true name and kind of nursing Norman back to health and obviously adopting him. So that is the one place and I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but where they kind of undermine the sort of masculine sense of growth and turn it into there's a little bit of a protective element, too, in terms of becoming I guess, you know, they're, they're post midlife crisis, new selves. I do, I do like that. If you want to get really dorky and be like Jewish symbolism, always, cow, I mean, there's a cow, that's a big oh, deal. Like, true, true. You, know, yeah. you know, there's a, like, that, there could be something there. Like <laughs> he's like, I don't know what it is, but I mean, maybe he just, I don't know. Maybe he felt some kinship from like, you know, studying Torah as a kid. And he's like, I like cows. They're, you know, good animal that, should be safe. I'll take your thread one step further. It's like a purifying heifer in like Jewish culture where you're sort of like sprinkled over with the ashes of the cow. That's kind of marks your purification, your rebirth. And there's certainly something he's clinging to it. If he lets this calf go, he's not going to be able to achieve that same sense of conversion. So he kind of needs to grab it. Can I grab that thread, Harry? Hold on. Let me just pull it a little bit more. OK, so when Norman is first born, you know, Curly is going with uh, Mitch and one of the cattle is uh, uh, kind of laid on the floor. Billy Crystal is helping this cow give birth. 
and it comes out and it's a red heifer because it's covered in blood. So, hey, maybe a little a little stretch, you know, I, but, I think uh, this is exactly what the filmmakers were going for. I think, yeah. you know, I think I think he feels a special kinship because he literally pulled Norman out of the womb of his, uh, its dying, his dying mother. And so he feels a very strong connection to it. But I do feel like, as I was saying earlier, how like Phil is sort of the nebbish of the nebbish kind of person, man. And Mitch is sort of finding himself in the middle. And Ed is sort of the macho. But there's nothing in being like an evolved man that says that you treat women well, you're like a maternal caring parent. And that's maybe like the super, super man that this uh, this film is sort of saying is like the end goal, that you're like a family man. You're also a tough person who can get shit done when you need to. And you can kind of finally figure out how to use that lasso and rope a cow, you know, when you need to. And when it comes down to it, you are not going to buckle under pressure. I, I really agree. I, I think this is more two pronged than we were getting at before, because like you were saying in that scene, he kind of takes over for the mother who passes the mother of the calf who passes away and becomes that sort of motherly figure. And one of the driving, you know, sort of impetus is in the beginning of the movie for why they go here is this uh, bring your father in to school day with his son, where he has to kind of like a career day. He has to go through his you know, career, which never happened to me when I was in school. I, I wish we had a day like that, but, um, but like he's, his son is very embarrassed of who his dad is. And I think learning to become a better father and be more, a more exciting father, a more nurturing father is absolutely a part of Mitch's journey. Also the scene, that scene, the guy before him, the, uh, the construction worker talking about his job is Amazing. like, so, and I mean, like, that's another thing about this movie that is like one of my favorite things that I don't, that I'm always on the lookout for is like the New Yorker going out right. of their limit is like insanely funny to me because like that guy, the construction worker talking about like, like lifting the, the beam off some guy's crushed legs or whatever. But he's like, obviously this like, just, oh, he's just this like slob. I love it. Like that's his element. Like that's Mitch's element. Like that's New York. And he's on the, the thing from, um, what is the tram thing? Oh, the, the Roosevelt Island ferry, yeah, right? Yeah, the yeah. he takes that, you know, he's like a real New Yorker. And like, it, it's like everything about that life is normal. And then you just take him out of it and he's a totally different person, but he's like, not, that's still not his element. And I just sort of, it just cracks me up like to no end seeing that kind of thing. And this is like the the one of the best examples of that I can think of. For sure. And, and it's also like worth pointing out in 91 that this is a PG-13 movie. And yeah. so like the amount of like adult content, we have adultery, we have cursing. I mean, that's par for the course for the 90s. I feel like they kind of got away with a lot. Um, nowadays, I feel like films would be much more uh, family friendly. Let's wrap up the film by saying, you know, after they come back from their trip, Spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't already watched the film. The film ends with everybody coming home. You know, Mitch reunites with his family. Ed ends up, you know, staying monogamous to his model of a girlfriend. And they end underwear up saying model underwear model girlfriend. Thank you. And he says, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to we're going to have a baby and just like that. That's that's gross. him saying it means like that's going to happen. OK, great. And then uh, we have Phil, who is uh, you know separated from his wife. But then in a sort of last minute reveal, him and Bonnie are getting into a taxi cab together. So that sort of implies that they're living happily ever after. And then, as we alluded to earlier, uh, Mitch is bringing home a little bit of the uh, range with him. And it, Norman is going to be adopted by their family because after they return all the cattle, the the ranch head has told them that all of the cattle are going to be sold at auction for meat. And I thought that was kind of an interesting turn that not only are we talking about masculinity, but let's also talk about like vegetarianism as like and, and the ethics of killing animals uh, after, you know, you're bonding with such an animal for such a long time that, you know, how could you then go around and kill him? So it, it ends up in a nice, you know, neat bow. Any final thoughts before we get into our ratings? I think the, the Robin's house becomes a dairy household. No meat in that house anymore. Sure. It's a very good commentary on that. I think that this whole ending to me, you're putting it into perspective now, but it's really about the family unit and, you know, becoming a father to that family unit. All of them are either having kids for the first time, embracing a monogamous relationship or, you know, in the case of, uh, of Mitch adopting Norman the calf. And like, I think that with the, with the cows, you know, sort of the herding, they were absolutely sort of parenting these cows. And that's why it's so hard for them to, I mean, the analogy is kind of weird here, like have all their kids get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. that, that part I didn't think through. 
Sure. Uh, but I do think that this sort of ending fits into this frame of masculine as be a being able to rope a cow, but also being able to be a good sort of traditional family father kind of totally. thing. I just can't imagine going back home to New York and telling my wife, hey, I got everything together. Also, this cow is moving into our apartment. Like that to me is like the only thing I am like, what? You're going to have to like, you can't live in New York with a cow. It's impossible. Yeah. How does that play out? Like what, what does it look like in two years where there's a full size calf in your living room in your you know Brooklyn what? apartment? To, to the movie's credit, he does mention that he's going to give it to a petting zoo after, at some point, but, fair, fair. but there's okay. going to be a rough couple of weeks for sure. Well, needless to say, our city slickers have grown up and have learned quite a bit. Uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with our ratings um, on city slickers. We'll be right back. And we're back to talk about City Slickers and what we thought about the film. We'll start out, Jason, by rating the film from one to five Jewish stars um, in the cast and crew department and then sort of in the content and story department. And then lastly, some Jewish themes on one to five Jewish stars. Uh, you're our guest. Why don't you start it off uh, by talking about the cast and the crew of the film? How do you feel like this film stacks up? I think in terms of cast, you have to give it a five. I mean, it's got at least five Jews. I mean, it's got Billy, Daniel Stern, Jake Gyllenhaal, Jeffrey Tambor is in it at some point. But then you've also got Josh Mostel, who's like, you know, Jewish actor royalty, you know, so you've got the, um, the fiddler on the roof connection there. So uh, kind of have to go with a five on that one. I think that's, that's just me personally. I will have to say for me, I feel like the uh, cast and the crew of the film would you know it's not a fully jewish uh, bench of jews you know like there are jews in the film enough that you know it's a noticeable pocket of of cast members but then there's also the other half right so you have to think about all the cowboys all the country folk who are like very decidedly not jewish so i'm gonna go like three stars maybe not a little bit more than half because our main characters you know two of them are jewish and uh yeah so i'll say like i'll say three stars harry how about you I was going to go pretty high also. I was pretty uh, convinced by what you were saying, Jason. I think the one outcast I saw in the cast was uh, Jack Palance. I was like, oh, well, you know, he's a big character in the film and he's bringing this sort of Western, you know, uh, heterage and not necessarily Jewish. But a quick Google search had his name come up on a website called Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. And I'm not sure it's not very well researched, but if he's Jewish, too, then I would say that the cast is pretty much, uh, you know, Jewish defined. And I think some of the crew is, as we mentioned, so. I've mentioned this in the past, but I think some movies would have to be more that there is a version of a film where, you know, if everyone on set is, is particularly Jewish to get my five, but I would still give this like a four and a half because I think most of the main cast is uh, and crew is Jewish. So I feel good about giving it that. How do we call it like the magnificent minion starring all the greatest uh, <laughs> of uh, Hollywood that is Jewish? Jason, as far as like the Jewish content of the film, the story, the plot, everything about it. Uh, did this seem like a Jewish film on one to five stars? I mean, yeah, it ha I, to me, it has to be a five. I mean, it feels so Jewish, like it's so neurotic. I mean, it's 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 a lot of the like tropes, I think, that most Americans equate to Jews, you know, not not always rightly so. But I do think that this movie really sort of set the template in a lot of ways for what was to come. I mean, obviously, like in a post Woody Allen, like Woody Allen kind of like laid the the groundwork and then Nora Ephron, I think also has um, no Jews in her movies, but they're also really Jewy to me. Oh, well, she's got Billy, I guess so that, 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 that I guess excludes that, that conversation. But I do think that it's like, sort of like very pop Jewish, if it makes sense. Like sure. it's not Jewish, but it's, it's Jewish for, for the, um, for the Smiths of uh, Iowa. And as a Jewish New Yorker, to me, it also it's, it's very familiar. So I can't really I can't really knock it down anything. I can't I have to say it's a five. It's definitely like a 90s as Jewish as it gets for somebody who I think lives in like Eau Claire, Wisconsin in 1991, who's maybe never met a Jew. It's about as it's basically a minion to them. Like it's a it's a Wisconsin minion. Okay. All right. Very generous. Very generous. Um, you know, uh, 
I feel like for me, the word I'm going to use is shot, like the simplest sort of log line of the film to me is not like a inherently Jewish uh, idea. I feel like although stretch territory, I, I wrote down like all this self-improvement and self-care is kind of like do, doing teshuva or like repentance or like self-growth. And I feel like that could be sort of like a um, a Jewish idea, which I could say for more for thematics. Uh, but I, from the content of the film, you know, there's no rabbis in the film. There's no explicit Jews, except these like caricatures of Ben and Jerry and things like that. And, um, you know, Mitch is, is, you know, Nebuchadnezzar at first, and then he grows into being this like fully formed human cowboy. So I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to go a little bit like a little pessimistic and not so, uh, not as generous as you, Jason. I might, I might also kind of stick maybe like two stars. It's like, I'm an, I'll, I'll save my vote. I don't want to tip my hand too much, but I'll save my my talk and my stars for for the themes. But uh, Harry, how about you? Content wise, where did this film stack up? Yeah, I think when when it comes to thinking about the content, my usual metric for sort of grading it is if someone was watching this, not the way we were with this Jewish lens, trying to pick out the Jewishness of it and just was kind of watching this cold afterwards. You asked them, did this feel like a Jewish movie? I think I'm somewhere in between the two of you, because I think explicitly this is a movie about three non necessarily Jewish friends that are going on this cowboy trip to, you know, get past their midlife crises and are learning about themselves. But there's nothing inherently Jewish to that or nothing explicitly Jewish really. But I do think that what you were saying, Jason, about that sort of Woody Allen feel that New York in the nineties Jewishness, that Billy Crystal effect of basically having him sort of in this movie. I think that when I was watching it, I, I was like, this feels like a Jewish movie, but it doesn't really it doesn't obviously look like one. So I would put myself kind of in between. I would say it's three because there are movies I've seen that don't have any sort of semblance of Jewishness that would kind of pull it below the two star thing. But this movie does feel Jewish, you know, Jewish, as I said before, even where it's not explicitly Jewish. So I would say it's like a two and a half, three on content. I kind of I lowered that a little bit at the end. Two and a half, three. Sure thing. And for our final category, uh, Jason, thematically, as a Jewish film, where do you think this film ranks? That's where I, I kind of like get tripped up. I mean, I don't think it's a very the, the themes aren't that Jewish unless if you really want to play into stereotypes of like the neuroses and the nebbish and this and that. Because if you want to play into those and say like all Jews are like nebbishy and this and that, which is not true, um, then it's a five. But if you want to be like, well, you got to be a little bit more nuanced about it. And I'd say it's maybe more of a three. If anything. Three out of five stars on, on the uh, themes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. I would say, you know, thematically, this film, you know, it mostly verges on like stretch territory. Like you can find Jewish things if you really dig underneath and you kind of pull back a lot of stuff about like morals and ethics. And like I said, doing teshuva, repentance, working on yourself. We have the cow, you know, that we talked about. But yeah, it's also not such a thematically Jewish film for me either. Um, so I'm going to probably just go like two and a half or three stars. Yeah. Harry. Yeah. And I, I yeah, I think I'm, I'm in a similar boat where there are the, the main, the dominant themes of this movie are about overcoming this sort of midlife crisis, about learning to be, you know, familial. I think we did talk something about embracing tradition to a certain extent right. and looking at deep mythologies and through that lens I, I think there is some jewishness to it i think there is some you know cultural religious jewishness of just figuring out you know your place the whole thing about pointing to the sky and this is obviously in our jewish read about it but if yeah. you want to talk about sort of the godliness and the spirituality of it i think i'm going to convince myself to give this a little bit more of a of a positive jewish spin thematically just because i think even though it was somewhat of a stretch to read some of these Jewish themes into it, it's, it's not mm -hmm. fully there. And I, I think that there is some spirituality to this movie. So I'll give it three and a half. I'll, I'll be a little generous with my uh, thematic ranking. Can I throw in a little, um, a little nugget here that might be a little controversial? Please. Please. What if you looked at this movie as a against intermarriage? Mm. he's married to a very gentile woman and i feel like you could you could easily say maybe the root of his unhappy i'm not saying this i mean i'm sure, very sure. obviously but i could see somebody being like hey if you don't marry your own guy if you don't marry another jew you're going to be i have heard that argument oh, um, interesting i've heard lots of people make that argument that 
uh, if you don't marry another Jew, you're going to be unhappy, which I don't, I'm not saying I believe that, Sure, but <laughs> I, you know, that's a very thematically sort of Jewish message. One other thing that I neglected to include in my review is, you know, these conversations they have on the horses, you know, man on man to man, you know, between Mitch and Ed and between Mitch and Curly talking about death, talking about Ed's, you know, childhood and everything. That's like sort of getting to the heart of of their issues is is, you know, th- those those I felt like were sort of some of the most touching scenes in addition to like all the slapstick and things like that. There are a lot of good like gags and, and funny bits throughout the film. But I felt like some of those. Uh, while not necessarily the most Jewish things, they were they were pretty touching. All right. So, Harry, Jason, any closing thoughts on City Slickers starring Billy Crystal? I'll go first. I, I, I think one of the interesting things about this podcast is not only listening to the fiddler to the fiddler on the roofs, you know, and watching the most explicitly Jewish movies, but kind of reading a Jewishness into movies that might not so obviously be Jewish. And I definitely had that experience watching this movie where it didn't seem explicitly Jewish. And I was at first trying to struggle, you're struggling to figure out how we were going to mine this for some Jewish values, but it was cool to sort of uncover some of the underlying themes and some of, by focusing on the Jewish of the cast and crew and some of the elements that bled into the film, just feeling this and watching this in a very different way than I would have otherwise. So I enjoyed the experience and I I hope our listeners can do the same. I obviously, I love this film and I have a real attachment to it going back to my childhood, but watching it as um, a a 40 year old Jewish guy now, um, I do, you know, I I think a lot about the idea of like how Jews are perceived in America and uh, the whole nebbishy thing and how, I don't know, I I, I sometimes wonder if like these sorts of portrayals were maybe hurtful in a way, like if maybe it didn't really, wasn't necessarily great for the Jews. It's a great movie. It's, you know, it's a classic 90s comedy. It's everybody's a better person in the end. I love that. I can't make fun of that. I can't really, there's nothing I can really say that's wrong about the movie, which is always a good sign because uh, I love to fetch and I love to nitpick, but um, you know, for what it is, it's a great film and it's very fun. And you know, Billy Crystal, I actually don't think Billy Crystal gets enough credit. Like he's, he, he's got so much heart and he's such a lovable guy and yeah, he just does a great job. And I think the rest of the cast, you know, like I said, I love Bruno Kirby. I love Daniel Stern. You know, it's a, it's a great cast. Jack Palance won the award. You know, that's that we, I don't even think we brought that up. He won the Academy award and famously jumped on stage and did a bunch of push ups. It's really, it's really weird. Go back and watch. Gotta watch that. Google Jack Palance push ups. You know, he it's, it's a good film. It's not like, some all time classic, but for what it is, I think it could have turned out a lot worse. Like it could be one of those movies that 30 something years later, we're watching it be like, Ooh, this is cringy. I feel like I'm not selling it enough, but I, I I'm not trying. I don't think I have to at this point. Cause it's, you know, so beloved and so well known, but I think just the fact that it's, we're here talking about it all these years later and can't really say anything bad about it. I think that's a testament to it. Like a film like this, I think, in, in in another director or writer or actor's hands, it could be just a, a miserable failure and it's it's not. All of what y'all said was great. And I wanted to just add that, you know, I feel like some of the most heartfelt scenes were when it was between, you know, Curly and Mitch or Mitch and Ed and uh, Phil. And, you know, just, just the way that they mature is it's a very wholesome film. It's a very funny film. Uh, there's a lot of good gags and, you know, a lot of lines that are kind of throwaway lines. But if you are like me, I'm sort of picturing myself uh, as Mitch, you know, I'm on the verge of turning 39 in April and I'm not quite at like midlife crisis territory quite yet. You know, I have two kids. I'm happy. I don't feel like I need a cow in my life. I'm all good in that department. But, you know, it was a very touching film. And, you know, I do feel like you were saying, Jason, the portrayal of some of like the Ben and Jerry type characters is a little like it's a little thin, you know, just in terms of, you know, if these characters were not written by Jewish screenwriters who maybe thought, oh, this would be funny. Let's have like nebbishy people. If if, you know, if you had non-Jewish writers and, you know, non-Jewish cast and crew, it would almost sort of seem like vaudevillian or stereotypical and kind of like not so good so in that regard it's kind of like eh, i could do without that but overall i feel like the 
sexism in the film is used as a way to sort of differentiate the good from the bad. Mitch is a fairly wholesome guy. And Phil's wife is sort of portrayed as the villain so that he can kind of get out of his relationship and kind of do repentance for being adulterous and, and kind of find a turn a new leaf over. Overall, yeah, I, I enjoyed the film. You know, question is, would I watch it again and or recommend it to friends? I mean, I would recommend it to folks who haven't seen the film. I don't necessarily need to watch it anytime soon. I think I'm good. How about y'all? Would you would you recommend or see this film again? I don't think it's like canon to me. Like it's. No, like like other films from the time, like Nora Ephron films, I watch them all the time and I love those movies unapologetically. And I tell everybody how much I love them and what an important writer she is to me. Um, and there's other stuff from the era from like the late 80s, early 90s that I do go to bat for, even though I don't necessarily know it's like certain it's a certain level, I guess, let's say. But um, no, I mean, I don't know. I don't think. I think it's a relic of the time and I think that's great. And I think relics are important. You know, I'm not going to tell somebody go out of your way to watch it. If you haven't, I don't know how it would translate in 2022. Right. I think, I think I'll probably save it for my 39th birthday. I'm, uh, I'm excited <laughs> to revisit, you know, wise and by years. And I liked what you were saying at the top, Jason, just about how that concept of the sort of midlife crisis when you hit the age of 40 might be something of a time. And maybe nowadays people aren't as bogged down by needing to prove their masculinity at, at 40, but uh, I'm excited to see what I think, you know, we'll revisit this in a couple of decades and see what happens. Awesome. Couple of decades, jeez. Just, just two. Just two. <laughs> uh, Jason Diamond, thank you so much for being here on Jews on Film to discuss City Slickers. I wanted to give you the opportunity to uh, plug or promote anything you have coming up, any exciting articles or things you'd like to talk about. I'm a contributor at GQ. You can read me there every week. Uh, yeah, I have two books. You know, uh, my first one was a memoir. It was called Searching for John Hughes. I mean, speaking of relics from a different decade it's about my obsession with um john hughes movies and growing up in that part of the country where all of his movies are based and then my other book is the sprawl which kind of takes a look at you know just i think i've always kind of been obsessed with the suburbs and how strange they are and also how much um culture the suburbs have sort of created for us but we sort of like look at the suburbs as this sort of like throwaway thing that none of us that people who live in cities try to get away from. And um, I kind of wanted to look at it from a different angle because that's what I'm all about. Thank you uh, so much for being here. It really you know, added another element to, to look at the film with you as a New Yorker, as a cultural a Jewish cultural expert whom others reach out to for uh, com commentary on things. So thanks for reviewing the movie with us. Harry, any closing thoughts? Anything to plug? No, th this was a blast recording it. I think we're going to have to have you back for our season two episode on Dirty Dancing. So yeah, we'll start looking at your calendar. Let's do Dirty Dancing or Clueless. Oh, cool. Okay. Right. Clueless is a big, it's a big Jew film. And so, it needs, needs to be respected as, as such. <laughs> we'll give it the validation it deserves. Absolutely. Yeah. As a Valley guy, I may be able to add some uh, interesting uh, perspective to that. But before we, uh, you know, when, once we end the recording, I want to tell you guys about a little uh, cattle herding trip. I think we should go on together. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Bye bye. Jews on Film is hosted and produced by Daniel Zana and Harry Ottensaucer. Daniel Zana edited this episode. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Jews on Film and subscribe to our podcast to get new episodes. Thanks for listening. Thank you.